Okay, hello everybody. Um, if we are lucky, we can now be heard um, online. And if not, then please, people online who don't hear me, uh, put, make a little post and uh, we'll see. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you all for coming, both people who are here in the room and people who are following online. And great to see you. So, uh, today we have a presentation by my dear colleague, uh, Tarek Beji. More on that later, of course. First, a little bit more about what, what we are um, here for, really. As uh, many of you know or are aware of, we normally have every year an IMFSE FSE day, really. So a full day event, um, students from different universities come together in one place, uh, some sponsors come together, so quite a number of people, and there are presentations, there is interaction. And of course, it's all very nice, it's as in you link your courses to some practical examples or some uh, cases, also some academic presentations potentially, and you talk to people and uh, maybe you find a position for an internship or maybe your next job or anything else. This year, that's unfortunately not really possible, having this international travel, especially for the sponsors and the students who are um, not here in Ghent at the moment. So what we have instead, which is on one side unfortunate, but it also gives us some real opportunities, is an uh, IMFC seminar series. And I say it gives us uh, some opportunities. Well, it's a different format, really, um, but now people who are not immediately part of the very close IMFC family can now also join us. So both here in the room, we have people from the MFSC uh, uh, courses. Thank you all for joining, great to see you. And also online, we have more people than we normally have from outside of um, IMFSC. So what we're going to have our six one hour seminars. We have three now in the first semester, so today, and then in three weeks time, same time, um, probably same place really. As, as, as in there will be a presentation here, maybe it will be a, a playing from online, but still you will be welcome here as well. Um, and then three weeks later again. The plan is to have two presentations per seminar. So the sponsors um, are, have been invited to contribute. They, we already have a number of suggestions in, both for now and both for after New Year. Uh, in three weeks time, what we are expect to see is presentation by OFR. Um, on, on experiments and a presentation by FPC risk uh, on some radiation modeling. But more on that later, and also uh, you will, of course, get all those notifications also with social media and the poster and everything. In the end, the goal is that we have a wrap up event. Well, the goal, the hope is that we have a wrap up event here in Ghent. We also hope for second year students that there will be an in person graduation. Naturally, we can't promise this at this time, but if there is um, a in-person event, we will also wrap up this series um, with all students and so on being invited. Uh, before each seminar, that's basically more of a service announcement there, um, there will be a small social media campaign. You will find the link there. And if there's anything not clear to you, just send me an email and I'll give you the correct link. That's also for people who are following online, of course. Very shortly about the seminar series itself. So we have a topic, just like MC Day uh, every year as a topic. Topic this year, and I said, well, we have a bit of an opportunity, so this is part of it. Topic this year is a bit more technical, as in we're talking really about um, modeling as a design tool and then challenges and benefits. So if you think about modeling and where you actually end up with, uh, you end with engineering applications, fine. But before I get there, you, you're using a tool, often software, um, and there are a number of uh, models there incorporated. Some can be very complex, some can be simple, some can be computationally very expensive, others not. And it's not always maybe perfectly clear as in, okay, which tool should you use and, and what does this imply? So we'll focus on that part. We also focus on the engineering applications themselves, of course. But before you go to those models, we even have a step before that, naturally, as in, okay, you want to now validate your models or even create them if there is no model available for this type of material or this type of situation. So we talk about experiments there. So three categories 
one overall theme, and that's basically what we have in offer for you today, uh, today, this entire year, and today uh, particularly with a keynote presentation by colleague Tarek Beji. So with that, thank you all, um, and people in the room, you can ask questions for sure. We will then uh, repeat your question because otherwise audio probably people online will not be able to hear you. People online, you're also very much uh, invited to ask questions, but do that in the chat, please. Um, and we are following up as well. So all, thank you very much. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Ruben, for the for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the RFSC board for the organizing this uh, series of uh, lectures. Thanks also to all the people involved in the practical arrangements, including Balsha and uh, Ruben. Uh, and thanks to all of you. And thank you to all of you for being present, either physically or uh, online. So uh, the title of my presentation is called The Art of Fire Dynamic Simulations Using uh, Computational Fluid Dynamics, and that's uh, CFD. So uh, computational fluid dynamics is, a, is, is a quite an advanced tool and an advanced technique that rests upon a very large body of knowledge uh, in terms of physics, in terms of chemistry, in terms of scientific computing, and that involves, for instance, numerical discretization techniques and as well parallel computing, for instance. In the IMFSC program, as well as in the local programs, so the MFSC and the postgraduate programs, what we're trying to do is to pass on a large body of knowledge, of the, a, a substantial deal of that uh, body of knowledge, passing on that to you. Uh, and uh, the idea is there you can use that body of knowledge to try to, for instance, master a CFD for design purposes. Perhaps not directly master, but at least to have the tools to self-learn and try to master the CFD for design purposes and for practical engineering calculations. So not only scientific research purposes, but really practical engineering calculations. And the word practical there is, is of prime importance uh, in the sense that you need to think of not only the, uh, let's say, the uh, complexity of the models and uh, the computational resources that you have available, but also bear in mind the reliability of your calculations for design purposes. You need to make sure that you perform quality simulations so, so that you are confident in the design solution that you are making uh, and you are proposing to have basically a fire safe building okay so uh here in fact you have some kind of a triangle and not so much the fire triangles that i teach every year in the very first lecture but a triangle that uh, compromise comprises three things uh basically it's a triangle so we have the accuracy you have the comp computational resources and you have the complexity of the model and you have to check and find how do these three let's say uh, interact with each other. Uh, in order to give you, let's say, uh, the global picture of that, I decided to uh, uh, describe that, first of all, in a conceptual way, to describe conceptually what does that mean, and what are the challenges with respect to fire safety engineering. And in order to be perhaps more clear, uh, I decided to illustrate that with two specific topics. The very first one being the soot problem and the second one being the liquid evaporation in pool fires. I cannot help myself being a bit technical, so I cannot make a full presentation being only conceptual, but I'll try to make the technical things that I will address for these two topics as clear as possible. All right? So let's talk first about the accuracy, complexity, and rapidity or computational resources, if you will. The very first thing that you can consider is uh, if you uh, take a CFD tool and you want to use it for design purposes, what you want to make sure is that you have an accurate solution. You perform a reliable simulation. And that is what I call here the deviation from the true value. So the lower the deviation from the true value, the higher the accuracy of your simulation. 
Obviously, intuitively speaking, you can imagine that in order to reach, let's say, a solution that is highly accurate, that is reliable, you need to have a numerical simulation or a computational model that is complex enough. Complex because you need to describe all parts of the physics, and intuitively speaking, you can think of the fact that the more physics you describe, the better, the closer you get to reality. So, in fact, intuitively speaking, you can say the more complex your model, normally speaking, it would be better in terms of accuracy. But perhaps not only in terms of complexity or number of models that you are using, you can use the same set of models and you can improve the reliability, for instance, by having a better resolution. For those of you who know already a little bit about CFD, you know, for instance, that the higher the resolution, so the lower the cell size and the gas phase, the better the results. That's a general uh, trend. I can give you examples where that is not uh, necessarily correct, but most of the time, the better the resolution you have in your CFD simulation, the lower the deviation, okay? So complexity here means complexity in terms of how many models you're, you're using to describe the physics, or as well, how many, let's say, pixels in your picture, in your CFD picture you're using, okay? So the ultimate goal, one of the main important goals is to make sure that your solution is accurate. But in fact, it becomes more complex than that if you consider the component with respect to the computational resources. So you want to have an accurate solution, but at the same time, you do not want to spend a lot of resources, uh, a lot of uh, hours for computing, and you want to make good, reliable calculations with perhaps low to moderate computational resources. Not everybody has access to supercomputers with hundreds of processors. Okay, so that's what you see here. Uh, you have an increase in the computational time as the model gets more and more complex, whether in terms of number of models or in terms of resolution. And ideally, the thing is that you need to realize is perhaps to try somehow to find a good compromise between the increase in computational resources and reaching an accurate solution with a minimal deviation from the true uh, uh, from the true value so perhaps if you think of kind of a threshold here you see that this is an optimum point let's say uh, that allows you to have a good compromise between accuracy and computational resources of course you see here if you follow for instance the blue curve you see that uh, the slope is becoming slower and slower so at this level Increasing the computational resources might perhaps improve slightly the results, but at a very high cost, okay? So you need to somehow find a way, uh, when I say you, not necessarily you at, and as end user, but also as model developer, to find a good balance where you have good accuracy without spending too much having too much computational resources to use. But the story beca becomes perhaps more uh, complex, uh, and that's in my opinion where beauty of CFD modeling for fire safety engineering lies, is trying to even simplify the models and simplify the complexity without compromising the accuracy. So in fact, what I think is the beauty of CFD for fire safety engineering is trying to bring this blue solid curve a little bit to the left. So you shift it so that you have a new curve where, for instance, you have for the same, for the same here accuracy, for the same accuracy, you spend less resources. You see this point, you have less resources less than here. Or if you have here you're spending the same resources. With the same resources, you have a better accuracy. You see this point? It goes closer to zero, so with a minimal deviation from the true value. And that's the beauty 
of fire CFD and computational fluid dynamics for fire safety engineering. This is, of course, my opinion. So some of the things that I will say in this presentation, there are scientific facts, but some of them are my personal opinion. Of course, some could agree and some could uh, disagree. Uh, there's also a way to, uh, to let's say, uh, have nice, uh, purpose for CFD simulations in fire safety engineering, and that's the uh, trying to shift the curve to the right. So you have cases where you would like to bring a little bit more complexity because you would like to uh, to have a better description of the physics, but you can do that, but that should be done not at the expense of computational resources. Most of the examples, or the two examples that I will show you uh, today, they are more describing what I show here on the slide. So trying to simplify uh, the physics without compromising the accuracy of the overall computational model that you are using. So you might think that perhaps this is the same could be considered as the same problem for all types of applications. And that is true. Every CFD user, regardless of what application he's using the CFD for, whether it is fire applications or engine combustion, would like to have good, reliable results at the lowest cost possible in terms of computational resources. So what I'm describing here is perhaps not only for fire safety engineering, but for all sorts of applications. But why is it perhaps even more important for fire safety engineering? Because fire-driven flows are extremely complex flows. Uh, these types of flows, they involve a lot of the physics, they do involve thermal radiation, they do involve combustion, they do involve chemistry, uh, they do involve uh, interaction with water for if you consider uh, suppression uh, systems. So, and they spread, uh, fire typically spreads over a wide range, uh, a large physical space. So all these are perhaps even more stringent constraints in fire safety engineering that make this uh, let's say, the purpose of reducing the computational cost even more important, okay? And perhaps uh, the best person to describe how complex uh, a fire is, uh, that is, in my opinion, Michael Faraday, my favorite scientist. And he says in a series of lectures that he performed describing uh, the chemical, that he calls the chemical history of a candle, Talking about a, con a candle, he says, there is not a law under which any part of this universe is governed which does not come into play and is not touched upon in these phenomena. By phenomena, he is discussing a candle, a laminar flame, a candle flame. And he goes on and says, there is no better, there is no more open door by which you can enter into the study of natural philosophy than by considering the physical phenomena of a candle. In fact, you see here how complex a fire is. If you take the words of a great scientist like Faraday for granted, which I do, it, it, this is illustrating how complex a fire is, and this is only for a laminar flame. Here, this is only for a candle small flame. Imagine what are the consequences when you consider a typical fire-driven flow, which is turbulent, which involves turbulence, and then you would have the interaction of turbulence with, chem with chemistry, turbulence with combustion, uh, uh, turbulence with thermal radiation, and so on and so forth. So that makes the problem, the modeling problem for fire, particularly challenging, and why, that's why we always want to have complex, let's say, simplified models without losing the accuracy. It's really challenging for fire-driven flows. Uh, so here I'm, I'm stating, for instance, in terms of modeling, what do, do we generally use modeling-wise? So for, for instance, in order to check the interaction between turbulence and, and chemistry, we typically use what is called the eddy dissipation model. So this is rated in the scientific literature in terms of turbulent combustion as kind of a not so much of an advanced model. Yet it is very interesting for us to use this model uh, essentially because it's simple, because with that model, you can focus on additional other things related, for instance, to radiation and 
other aspects of the physics. Uh, it's possible and it's true that it does not describe perhaps the, the chemistry as well as more advanced models that uh, such as, for example, here, conditional moment closure, which is a very advanced and sophisticated model, but we can still use it, and there are subtleties and some kinds of finesse in using the eddy dissipation model where you can incorporate chemistry, uh, so the model remains simple, but yet still useful. And we do have, I'm talking about my experience in terms of a researcher applying for grants, sometimes people reading the proposals, they do not realize that you can do a lot of things with simple models. So if you talk to somebody outside the fire safety community, so the bigger community would be the combustion community, he would tell you, okay, you're using the edit dissipation model as a kind of basic model. This is not state of the art. There is, is you, you need to go beyond state of the art and use more different let's say, more complex models. So if you are interested in pursuing some work, research work, and for instance, combustion, you need to bear in mind that we can still use simple models, but it depends on how you use them and how you make them interact with other models, and that remains still interesting. The idea is really not to use brute force doing detailed chemistry with hundreds and hundreds of processors. But the idea is to try to be clever. At some point, we might have the computational power to describe in all details or in as much detail as possible all the features of the flow. But in the meantime, I think that's where the beauty of modeling is, is to really try to be clever and use simple models without losing accuracy. Another, the same goes on, for instance, here for thermal radiation. Uh, typically speaking, you know that thermal radiation uh, typically varies as a, as a function of the wavelength. So there's a spectral dependence of the radiation intensity. That is something that we typically do not do in, in, in fires. We typically use what we call the gray assumption. And that's much simpler. We do not account for the spectral dependence. Now, this is an example where I show you that using a simple model does not mean that you do not understand the physics or you you may maybe ignore aspects of the physics in in fact it does make sense in fire driven flows to use the simple gray gas model because generally speaking in fire driven flows you do have a lot of soot that is produced and soot is different from gas soot radiates over a wide range of wavelengths that makes us be confident in using a gray gas assumption. So again, this is a small example showing you that a simple model does not necessarily mean that you ignore a lot of the physics and that you have a lot of uncertainty in your results. If you use some observations, some physical interpretation of the fire flow, the fire driven flow, you might naturally end up using simpler models, but you have to be careful uh, with that. Another example of uh, complexity of models and can we or can we not use simpler models is the interaction of a fire driven flow with water sprays. So there's a master thesis that is going to be on this topic and the general question that we will try to answer in this master thesis is does it make sense or is it worth it to use a monodispersed uh, spray as opposed to a polydispersed spray. So a monodispersed spray, it means that essentially you are considering a water spray as a collection of droplets with the same diameter, okay? Which is not actually physical. Generally speaking, when you use a water spray, so it's from a sprinkler of, or from a water mist no nozzle, you have a distribution in terms of droplet size. So if you wanna be accurate, generally speaking, you wanna describe that distribution in terms of droplet size, okay? Now the question is, so describing that distribution, let's say, um, uh, requires some computational resources, okay? So the alternative would be to, you, to say all the droplets, they do have the same size, and that's what we call monodisperse. So the idea there, could we have reliable results with monodisperse do we lose a little bit of accuracy, but not much, or do we lose a lot of accuracy? So that's one question. The second question is, to what extent we are going to save time if we use monodisperse as opposed to polydisperse? 
So here I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, uh, let's say, using the opportunity to uh, cancel one meeting with my student who's there. So now you know the topic. And I explained very well here, I think, what are the objectives? Uh, what are the questions that we need to, to answer? I'm uh, sorry for pointing you out. I didn't mean to do that. But uh, uh, this, is, this is, I think, going to be a very interesting topic. Now I'm going to take two big specific topics and try to describe them as clearly as possible. I try not to be too technical. It will be not very technical. I want you really to understand almost everything of what I'm saying. So the first topic is the suit uh, problem. So this is a topic that I have worked on uh, uh, quite some time ago, and uh, I'm going to work on it uh, very soon with a new PhD student. Uh, so first of all, what is suit? Uh, if you want to follow Faraday's quotes, one thing you can do is, first of all, to go to the candle flame and see there if you can what suit is, what kinds of diagnostics you can use in order to visualize suit inside the candle flame. Now, typically speaking, th technically speaking, this is not a candle flame, that, but we call it a candle-like flame. So it's a small flame, a flame that is as small as a candle, which is laminar, it's, it's not turbulent. So that's why we call it a candle-like flame. So what we do, first of all, to understand what suit is, we go into that flame and try to uh, visualize a suit, okay? So this is um, a burner that is called Santoro's burner. You see the flame is very small. The radius here, uh, so you have the flame, the gas that is injected here, and you have a co-flow of fresh air around it. The idea behind the co-flow of fresh air is to have a nice uh, stable flame. So you have a stable flame with a nice uh, shape as you see uh, in here. So we go into that flame and use some diagnostic tools to see what suit is. And this is what you can see here inside the laminar flame with a technique, an experimental technique that is called transmission electron microscopy. So TEM. In fact, you, you can clearly see here, perhaps not at 10 millimeters above the burner surface, but at 20, 30, and 40, you can see some uh, agglomerates of, of some particles. These are typically carbonaceous particles. They are particles made of carbon. So there are molecules that gather together, and uh, by different mechanisms, in the end, you can end up with big clusters of carbon, and that is soot, okay? So you see the difference here between this column and this column? is that this is a column for a non-smoking flame. So here at 40 millimeters, you, start, you have some soot, and then above at 50 millimeters, you do not have soot anymore. A, smoke, a flame that is incipient smoking, so it's starting to be smoking, you see that you still have, you see here at 40, you have soot, and here you don't have soot anymore. But for the smoking flame, at 50, you still have soot, and you start to have some oxidation of soot until you don't have suit anymore at a much higher level here, uh, 90 millimeters. So you see a uh, big complex. You see, perhaps it's not very clear here, but here it's in the order of, of uh, fractions of, of a micrometer. OK, so it's very small. Obviously, we are not able uh, in practical simulations to track these uh, uh, these agglomerates one by one and check how they are formed. So we need to do something about that to have practical calculations of soot uh, in, a, in, a, in a fire. And in fact, the chemistry is quite complex, so complex that sometimes you end up with chemical mechanisms that, uh, that uh, use more than 200 species, for example, this is a mechanism that uses 202 species and more than 1,000 chemical reactions. All this describes, all these describe the process of soot, okay? So you see how complex soot formation is. And the question, of course, that I will answer afterwards is, can we afford to do that, okay? But you can have 
let's say, a general picture of how soot is forming, and it's the following. Uh, so you start from uh, the fuel molecule, and that fuel molecule will undergo some chemical reactions that do form what we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so PAH. So these molecules, they're quite rich in, in uh, carbon, and they start to, uh, let's say, uh, undergo some chaining. So they are start to stick to each other until they reach the level of what is called here high order aromatics. So with a lot of carbon uh, in it. Now you have clusters with a lot of carbon in it, and then there's a mechanism that removes the hydrogen that you get from the original fuel molecule. And that mechanism is called H abstraction C2H2 addition, C2H2 being acetylene. And then only you have pure soot carbon uh, clusters. Obviously, after soot is formed, if it meets oxygen or other radicals, it might be oxidized and then you do not have soot or you have carbon monoxide. So soot is also important for the production of carbon uh, monoxide. And that's what I mean here by toxicity. Uh, you know that uh, when you compute a fire-driven flow, you look at the heat and you look at the toxicity. So in terms of toxicity, soot is by itself toxic, but it also leads to the formation of carbon monoxide. And you know that carbon monoxide is the chief killer in fires. So from that perspective, soot is extremely important. In terms of heat transfer, it's, it's dominant with respect to the thermal radiation. So thermal radiation is the dominant heat transfer mode in fires. That, that's what make it, what's, makes it, what's making the fire become bigger and bigger. So it's really essentially through thermal radiation. So these two points highlight the importance of soot. So we cannot ignore soot in fire-driven flows. So we need to do something about it. Obviously, we cannot, uh, let's say, calculate uh, and go through all the detailed chemistry that I was explaining in the previous slide. So we need to do something uh, about it. And for fire-driven flows, even more than other uh, applications, we need to have fast calculations or we need to make reliable calculations with low to moderate uh, computational resources. But a specific thing to fire, because sometimes we're only the fire safety community or fire dynamics we only uh, are perceived as the small sister of the combustion community as a whole but we have our specific uh, aspects that we really need to uh, highlight and in fires you do not know the fuel anything could burn like this table the chairs and you do not know in most of the cases the exact of that fuel molecule more than that in a fire in, in a practical fire you do have a collection of several combustible items which are made of different molecules and that is extremely complex to account for if you want to have accurate calculations of the chemistry so this is a very specific thing to fire we are not we do not know what is burning basically which is opposed to some other applications like for instance uh, combustion engines in combustion engines you you do know your fuel and you have a limited area where you know a combustion is taking place. For us in fires, it's extremely complex uh, because we do not know the fuel and fire spans across wide range, uh, wide, let's say, uh, surface areas. So one of the models that tries to uh, consider these constraints and yet uh, uh, remain, let's say, uh, accurate uh, that's the main goal, at least. It's called the laminar smoke point concept. And here I'm going to just describe the laminar smoke point uh, concept in a brief way. So essentially, you consider a small laminar flame. Okay. Uh, so you do not see any smoke, any soot escaping from its tip. Somehow, if you increase the flow rate of the gas, the flame will become taller and you start perhaps seeing a little bit of soot escaping, but not so much. And after a while, if you increase the flow rate of the gas even more, the flame becomes taller and it starts becoming, let's say, smoking. So you start seeing smoke escaping from uh, uh, the tip of the flame. So the laminar smoke point height is a crit critical height or a 
corresponds as well to a critical flow rate, above which you start seeing smoke being flowing out of, uh, escaping from the tip of the flame. So this height or this flow rate is an information that tells you about how sooty a fuel is, how much soot it does produce. In the sense that if you take a very sooty fuel, a fuel that produces a lot of soot, that critical flame height will be quite short. So very quickly with a small flow rate, it becomes sooty. If a flame, if a, a fuel is less sooty than that, you, will, you would need more flow rate and you would need the flame to become taller be before it becomes smoking. Okay, so this is a physical measurement and uh, that could be that uh, an experimental measurement that you can have for every type of fuel which gives you an information about the propensity of a specific fuel to produce soot. And it could be any type of fuel, and it could be a gas, it could be liquid, it could be solid. So there's a, a standard apparatus that is used in order to calculate the laminar smoke point height of every fuel. So these, are, these things are tabulated and uh, what you see here is a bench scale test that has been, uh, 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 let's say, deposited as a patent by John Deris and uh, Mark Stein from uh, FM Global. And with this uh, bench scale test, you are able to measure the laminar smoke point height of a solid uh, fuel. So without going a lot into the details, you have some kind of a, here a, cham a chamber where the solid fuel becomes gas, it produces a flame, and then you have some uh, detectors to capture if there's soot uh, or not escaping from the tip of the flame. So this is a standard measurement, okay? A standard measurement that gives you the ranking of fuels in terms of their propensity to produce uh, soot. And perhaps here I would like to emphasize on uh, the fact that John Deris is an amazing uh, modeler, uh, an amazing numerician, and George Mike, Mark Stein is an amazing experimentalist from what my PhD supervisor, uh, Michael Delicatius, told me. So this is the perfect combination between an experimentalist and a numerical modeler or an analytical modeler to produce something that could help us improve the models that we are using in fire safety science in general. And this is just a short list of some fuels ranked with respect to uh, their propensity to, f to produce uh, soot. And you see here that the higher the smoke point, the lower or the less sooty the fuel is. You see that for methane, which is not very much sooty, the smoke point is quite high. For propylene here or heptane, the smoke point is lower than that, which means that heptane is sootier than methane. There's just a slight, uh, uh, let's say, adjustment that is made here in the sense that, strictly speaking, you should not take into account only the smoke point height, but you should also take into account the molecular weight of your fuel, okay? So that is taken into account in what is called the threshold sooting index. So here is slightly different a ranking, but which takes into account the molecular weight of your fuel. Now, up to this level, I have not proposed any suit model. I simply used or described uh, uh, an experimental measurement that is used to rank the fuel, the fuels in terms of their propensity to produce suit. The question is, can I use that information in order to have a suit model, okay, that describes reasonably well the chemistry uh, for in fires with respect to soot. And there, what, we, what is done in the literature, some of the work that I did a few years ago, is to propose an Arrhenius equation for the soot formation rate. So this is per se, 
nothing new. So we we know that uh, uh, if you want to model a, a gaseous re reaction, wh whether it is an oxidation reaction or some kind of another reaction, you can do that using an Arrhenius uh, equation. So I'm, I'm going to spare you here the details of this equation because it's just a regular Arrhenius equation with some parameters in there. But perhaps what's more interesting is how to generalize this equation to any fuel. So do not be mistaken, this is not the laminar smoke point model. In fact, the laminar smoke point model lies in this equation. So here, what it says, uh, I apologize for the symbol, it's not clear there. It, the pre-exponential factor A is inversely proportional to the laminar smoke point height. And this is a key this is a key equation in the suit model that I propose here and that I describe here, is that in principle, you, if you know your pre-exponential factor for a specific fuel, you can guess what would be a good estimate of the pre-exponential factor for any other fuel if you know the laminar smoke point height. So this is allowing us to generalize the model, okay, to in principle any fuel for which you know the laminar smoke point height. And there are mixing rules, so if you know, uh, if you have a mix, mixture of two fuels and you know the laminar smoke point height of each, you can also estimate the laminar smoke point height of the mixture. So this is one way to generalize the soot chemistry to any fuel that we have in fire. And this is taken into account the specific thing that I told you about fuels in fires in the, in, which, and which is the fact that we do not know the chemistry. So here you do not know the chemistry per se, you do not know the, what is the chemical molecule involved in fire, but you simply need to, you, to get an estimate of the laminar smoke point height. Okay, so you can you just take samples of typical combustible materials that you have in a specific, uh, let's say, enclosure, you do the test if tests have not been done already, and then you can have an estimate of the soot formation rate. Now, uh, these, I, I give you here some additional uh, references, uh, and I, I uh, put here the reference of uh, Lothenberger and de Ries, who did also uh, a very interesting work uh, using the laminar smoke point height. Uh, where the formation rate of soot is not so much an Arrhenius like what, I, what we proposed with Professor Delicatios, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a polynomial function, but the principle is the same. And I also uh, would like to draw your attention to another reference if you are interested in that, and that's uh, Chatterjee and his co-workers at FM Global in the US. And there, you know, Pratip makes the uh, connection uh, between the laminar smoke point height and not only soot chemistry but also soot radiation because as i mentioned soot chemistry is tightly linked so you know you need to know the soot the content of a flame to have and make accurate calculations of thermal radiation he does the direct link per se between the laminar smoke point height and the thermal radiation so that was uh, the first example that I uh, w wanted to uh, describe to you uh, and uh, which gives you uh, an illustration of how we simplify things and but nevertheless without losing the physics. Second example that I also that I like quite much and it's about liquid evaporation in, in pool fires. Uh, so pool fires are, um, let's say, fires that you can encounter in several uh, industries. And it consists essentially of a liquid here, a liquid pool, that evaporates and burns and produces a flame. So if you look at the whole picture, you do have a very strong coupling between the liquid and the gas in the sense that the liquid evaporates, produces gas, the, which is essentially the flame, and the flame radiates back to the liquid surface. The more it radiates, the more you have evaporation, okay? And so on and so forth. So this is a complex interaction between the liquid and the gas. What we typically do in engineering calculations, 
is that actually we, we ignore the liquid phase and we simply say we have an estimate of the evaporation rate and we're just going to use the evaporation rate as an estimate to calculate what happens afterwards. To, so to really focus, we really, generally speaking, in engineering calculations, focus only on the gas phase. The problem is that that might work in some applications, but in some other applications, you have you really need to take into account this coupling. Otherwise, you, you miss a lot of the physics. Uh, so without going into the details, we encountered in our research team situations where you cannot describe correctly the fire dynamics involving a liquid pool fire without taking into account the liquid phase and the heat up and evaporation and how it connects to the gas phase. Okay, so uh, that's and that's what you need to do if you want to have a fully predictive simulation, meaning that you do not need to estimate the evaporation rate. It's something that is you model that you try to predict. Okay. And this is a topic that I that I uh, worked on for a while now. And uh, in order to, let's say, propose a simple model that takes into account what happens here at the level of the liquid phase, you need to have an overall picture, an overall idea of the overall picture. So you need to, uh, let's say, consider almost everything what's happening in the liquid phase. And here I'm going to uh, go very quickly through what's happening at the liquid phase so that you are aware of what are the components of the physics involved in there. Because in simplifying a physical phenomena, you need first to know what's the overall picture, what are all the components, and then if you want to simplify, you can say some components, I'm going to leave them for this reason or that reason, and I'm going to focus on one. And that's how you simplify basically models. So uh, in terms of liquid heat up, in the case of a, of a pool fire, you have what is called the heat up from the burner walls. So you have a pan, for instance, made of steel. And if you have a flame, that flame will heat up the steel, and the steel will heat up the liquid, so from the sides. So what happens here is that you see there in red, you have the steel that is very high uh, in temperature, at uh, very hot, at a very high temperature. You have perhaps here the liquid surface and the side here at a slightly lower temperature. And you have the bottom here that is still cold. So we have some kind of a circulation zone from hot to cold, OK? this is basically heat transfer by conduction. You have the heat going from the parts where you have the highest temperature to the parts where you have the lowest temperature uh, through these intermediate parts of intermediate temperature. So you have some kind of a vortex here that is heating up the liquid from the sides, and that's uh, because the burner walls that perhaps are made of steel, in this case, I assume, uh, they heat up the liquid in this way. So that's one mechanism for the heat up of the liquid. A second mechanism is called the surface tension effect. So what's the surface tension effect? So when you do have a flame exerting a heat flux at the surface of a liquid, that heat flux will typically not be uniform across the surface. So typically you would have in the center high temperatures and slightly lower temperatures at the sides. Because simply that's how, let's say, the, the, the flame is radiating onto the surface. It's not uniform, but it, it, there's a kind of a view factor that makes these uh, differences in the, uh, in the heat flux and therefore on the temperature. So the temperature, when you have a, a, a liquid that is being heated up, it has an influence on what is called the surface tension. So the surface tension is, is the force that is holding the molecules at the surface of the liquid. So that force is going to change because of the change in temperature. And typically, with respect to surface tension, the surface tension generates a movement of the liquid from the regions where you have the lowest surface tension, where you have the highest temperature, to the highest surface tension. So we have a movement of the liquid from the center to the side. So this is also a mechanism that is heating 
the liquid. Okay, that is generating some convection current inside the liquid. Now, the third mechanism to complete the picture of how the liquid is being heated up, there is one third mechanism that is called in-depth radiation. So basically, uh, with respect to in-depth radiation, the liquid is not considered as opaque, so radiation does not hit the surface and go out. No, in fact, liquid is called semi-transparent, so some of the radiation will penetrate inside the liquid, okay? So what happens when the radiation penetrates inside the liquid is that you have below the surface temperatures that are slightly higher than at the surface. Okay, so in this case, you have a cold or a slightly hot liquid sitting on an even hotter liquid. So if you have cold on top of, on top of hot, that is what is called hydrodynamic instability. You always, the, 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 let's say, the hot fluid will try to rise above the cold fluid, okay? So because of that, the cold, so the hot fluid will rise above and try to go up, and that generates as well convective currents, okay? And that leads to the heat up of the top layer in the liquid that I would call vaporizing liquid. And beneath that, you have rather cold liquid. So all these things, describe or I try to give you a general picture of what are the mechanisms that are involved, the physical mechanisms that are involved in heating up the liquid in this kind of situation, and I mean by that liquid pool fire. Now, in terms of modeling, how to simplify the modeling, generally when we use simplified modeling, we try to say or to, let's say, ignore some physical phenomena, but that has to be done cautiously, wisely. And what I say here, for instance, and that's something that we know from literature, with very large diameters, the heat up from the burner walls, so the heat conduction from the burner walls becomes negligible. So if we are considering a case where the diameters are sufficiently large, we can ignore, we can ignore the heat heat up from the burner walls. The second statement that I'm making here is that if you have a relatively deep liquids, and this is something also we know from the literature, the surface tension effects become negligible with, in comparison to what, I, uh, what is remaining and which is in-depth radiation. So the model that I, that I just described the features of here, I will not show you detailed equations, uses this assumption, the assumption that the in-depth radiation is the mechanism that is dominating heat transfer within the liquid and that is generating convection, convective motion because of the hydrodynamic instability that I was mentioning. Okay? So the question now is how to account for this convection movement, convective movement of the liquid without solving the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay? Because here... One thing you can do is to simply say, I'm solving the Navier-Stokes equations inside the liquid, so there you, you can solve the motion of the liquid. Okay? But what we want to do, and this makes me come back to the main story here, we would like to propose something that is simpler. We already solved the Navier-Stokes equations for the gas phase. If we also do it for the liquid phase, it will be very computationally expensive. Okay? So that's the question that I'm asking here, how to account for convective motion without solving the Navier-Stokes equations. And the solution to that is to use a concept that is quite often used in the literature and that is called the effective conductivity concept. So in, in, instead of modeling the heat up due to convective motion, I'm, I'm just gonna say I will increase artificially the thermal conductivity of the liquid, okay? The question is of course, how to increase it and that is through this equation. So you, the effective conductivity, which, which, let's say, describes the fact that you have improved heat up inside the liquid because of the convective motion, is proportional to the actual conductivity through the Nusselt number. Now, I'm going to spare you the details, but there are few papers 
including one that I like very much by Sikan and Hostika, describing how to calculate this parameter. We did at UGAN some more theoretical work trying to improve the way of estimating this Nusselt number uh, in order to have, an, uh, let's say, an estimate of the effective conductivity. Okay, one future work that we plan to do uh, uh, with respect to this topic is why not consider the liquid as two-layer liquid. So we have, and this uh, this is something that we see uh, by visualization, uh, but vi by visualizing experimental data, we generally see that there's a thin vaporizing la layer, and underneath that layer, you have another layer that is being preheated. So uh, one thing that we plan to pursue here is to propose a model where instead of solving 1D Fourier's equation with too many nodes inside the liquid, why not just use two zone uh, uh, framework? This is very much analogous to something that is much more established in the literature, which describes smoke stratification in the early stages of the fire. So in the early stages of a fire, you have a smoke layer, a hot layer, an upper layer that is sitting on top of a cold layer of fresh air. So this is perhaps this, the same concept, but applied to the liquid phase in the case of uh, a liquid pool fire. And the idea is to have more physics, so involving what ha what's happening at the liquid phase, but without having a huge cost computationally speaking, of course. Yeah. For a simple case, we would account for the temperature difference between the two, uh, betwe between the two layers. But of course, in some uh, practical cases, you might have some mixture of liquids. So that is a level of complexity that might be integrated at some point. But for now, generally speaking, the very first step is essentially to consider uh, the liquid uh, with respect to the thermal structure. So with respect to difference in temperature, because that is directly relevant and related to the evaporation rate. And the evaporation rate is related to the burning rate, to the heat release rate, and all of you know that the heat release rate is extremely important in describing the fire dynamics in an enclosure, for instance. So uh, just two very simple messages that I would like you to, to have by the end of this uh, lecture, which I hope was clear enough uh, for you, is first of all, to have in mind the subtlety in the terminology. Uh, very often, sometimes you might hear the word simple model. I personally do not like to call the models that we use simple, but rather simplified. Because when you say simplified, it means that you have a sense of what are the global physics involved in there, that you took out some aspects because for specific circumstances you can do that, and you ended up with a simplified model. But if you say just simple model, that is, does not, let's say, give justice to perhaps some preliminary work that would have been done in developing these kinds of models, okay? Uh, and, and it's actually, if you do that, you ignore all the process of simplification and that I mentioned here, and that's where the creativity lies. Uh, it, it lies in trying to find simple ways to describe the physics, but without compromising uh, the, let's say, the, uh, the uh, cost of your simulation. So that's really the main message that I wanted to give to you with this lecture. And perhaps a final message is to make a small parallel uh, with the architecture. So uh, uh, I, I talked about art, so architecture is kind of a combination between science and engineering and as well art. And here I'm, I'm quoting uh, an architect, Van der Rohe, and he says, less is more. And that is with respect to arranging the necessary components of a building to create an impression of extreme simplicity. So this is kind of a whole, uh, a whole trend in architecture, which is perhaps something that could be applied to what I was discussing with you today. In fact, to be honest with you, 
Uh, I knew about minimalism in architecture, but I thought less is more is just some kind of a slogan from a sleazy commercial about perfume. I don't know if you if you know that, uh, but it's actually really more than that. Uh, and just a final note on uh, something that is more oriented, a quote that is more oriented towards technology and engineering, and that's from the designer Fuller, and he says, or he tries to do more with less. And this is what I try to express in this lecture with two specific examples uh, related to how to propose simple fire dynamics models without, so without compromising the accuracy and bearing in mind computational resources. So thanks a lot for your, uh, for your uh, attention. And if you have questions, of course, I'll be very glad to answer them. So I, I would just inform the people who are online that uh, a, a picture is being taken. <laughs> so, so maybe just wait a little bit before, if you have questions, please ask them after a few minutes. Yeah, so um, I don't know if I can not read exactly from there. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, I can see it. I can see it on the screen. So uh, a question by Professor Arnaud Trouvé uh, from the University of Maryland, and he says, experiments with soot or fuel evaporation rate are typically data poor. Not many quantities are measured. Simple models have a lot of uncertainties. How do we validate them? So uh, my answer first would be about uh, the uh, lack of experimental data. So uh, it's true that the data is quite scarce, especially in our field, uh, perhaps in these uh, problems that I described for soot and for the liquid, uh, for liquid heat up and evaporation. So there, uh, before perhaps talking about uncertainties, one thing that I would like to have and I'm trying to push is to have more data and to in fact, uh, interact more with experimentalists. For instance, for the case of liquid pool fires, one thing that is not so difficult to get is to measure the temperature inside the liquid in the event in the case of a pool fire. So there, the data, there is data, but it's very scarce, but at least it shows the way that it's possible. Uh, to be more technical, so uh, you can simply think of very thin thermocouple temperature measurements inside the liquid, and that at least could give us, uh, let's say, an estimate of the thermal structure within a liquid for several types of cases in terms of fuel, in terms of uh, burner diameter, and then we can have some estimate of, for instance, the thin vaporizing layer that is there, and we can do that for several cases. So, uh, in fact, some of the work that is has been done uh, has been done prior to experiments. So, the idea is to use that work to push experimentalists to perform more 
data that would validate or at least try to hint at some, uh, let's say, ways to improve what is already proposed. That's with respect to the liquid, uh, uh, liquid evaporation rate problem. Uh, with respect to suit, um, well, simple models have a lot of uncertainties, so that's, uh, that's true. Uh, but it, in fact, that's, for the moment, if you want to have really, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, a practical model for suit, we cannot do otherwise than proposing a simple thing. But uh, there are ways to validate them, if not perhaps indirectly, if not directly, we can do that at least directly, indirectly. So this suit, we know that it does have an influence on the thermal radiation. So if we do not have the possibility, for instance, to, uh, to measure suit concentrations directly, but in fact they are, so we really need to push experimentalists to do some more work for us, and I believe some of that work is done at FM Global, we can at least try to find ways to, to validate our models indirectly, for instance, through measurements of the thermal radiation. Uh, I, I hope I answered your question fairly okay, uh, Arno, but please uh, do not hesitate to reply back if anything is, is not clear or if you do not agree with any of what I was just saying. Okay, I'm happy. Okay, so the question is, uh, the question is about uh, in-depth radiation. So how come we end up with a situation where a hot liquid is uh, beneath a cold liquid? So um, the, uh, the starting point there is that you have a thermal radiation that is coming from the flame at the level of the liquid surface. Okay. Now, the liquid is not completely opaque. And what does that mean is that some of the thermal radiation will penetrate inside, okay? So it will penetrate inside the liquid, few millimeters below the surface. So because you have some heat that is penetrating few millimeters below the surface inside the liquid, that region where thermal radiation has reached will be slightly hotter. You have a source term from thermal radiation as opposed to the surface. The thermal radiation will go through the surface all the way to an in-depth region. So you have a source term from radiation that is not at the surface, but it's slightly below the surface. And that will heat up locally that region below the surface to the point that very quickly and very, uh, these things, they do not take much time. And there's experimental evidence for that. Very quickly you have a hot spot below the surface. So hot spot meaning a quantity of liquid that is hotter than the surface, okay? Because you have source that is, uh, you have in-depth radiation that is going deep inside the fuel, okay? Uh, once you end up with this situation where you have cold, uh, hot, uh, uh, hot liquid and above it is slightly cold, it's not cold, or slightly, colder uh, liquid, then you have this hydrodynamic instability and you have convective uh, motion. So the hot liquid slightly below the surface will always want to rise below the slightly cooler liquid. And that's how we have these convective currents. And the consequence of that is that you have a good mixing, you have quite some mixing of uh, the liquid at the top surface, spanning across few millimeters, and the consequence of that mixing is that you have a uniform, more or less uniform temperature across that thin layer. And that we see it experimentally uh, uh, for several uh, test cases. I'd suggest that we officially web up. Right? Yeah. 
So with that, I'd suggest that we um, officially wrap up. We will remain online a little bit more. So if there are some uh, online additional questions or people here in the room, if there are some additional questions, can still uh, do that. We're considering our time is up. I again want to thank everybody online, everybody here um, in the room for taking the effort of coming here and uh, have a nice evening. So thank you all. And that's all L one last time online and uh, in the room. Uh, thank uh, Professor Beji for the uh, lecture tonight. Okay. Thank you.